Hi, I'm Bill Arnold. Thank you for listening to this podcast. There are many more podcasts available at MyFaithRadio.com. Your support makes this possible. Thank you. And a warm welcome to the afternoon show. I'm Bill Arnold, and you might wonder how do true Christians, how do they persevere in the gospel? Because John warns of Antichrist coming in the last hour, and they'll, they will deny that Jesus is God's son. But the Holy Spirit anoints believers so they can recognize the true gospel, and that's what we want to do. And fortunately, that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, with my guest, Dr. Andy Davis. He is the senior pastor of First Baptist Church of Durham, North Carolina, and founder and teacher of twojourneys.org, twojourneys.org. I go there regularly. It's a fantastic uh, resource, and I encourage you to do it. Andy, so nice to have you back. Bill, always a delight to talk to you. I'm looking forward to this topic today. I love this. So let me first ask you about your your hometown and what's I know what's gone on the last uh, couple of days. How are you holding up? Yeah, um, our state, North Carolina, has been hit hard with Hurricane Helene or uh, Tropical Storm Helene. Lots and lots of flooding in the western mm-hmm. part of our state. It's a good good distance from us, but we have a lot of friends that live out in that area, and uh, there's, it's okay. going to be months uh, to rebuild. So there's lots oh. of opportunities for us to serve and and see the Lord at work. Yeah, I'm so I'm so so sorry um, to hear that, yeah. but I'm I'm glad the church is stepping up and doing everything they can. That's a beautiful tes- yeah. testimony to God's love. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. All right. I can't. I, I really want to talk about the antichrist that are coming in the last hour and and how we yeah. can as believers recognize the true gospel. So let's yeah. prepare for the future trials. How do we do it? For sure. Yeah, you're referring to First John chapter two, and um, John warns uh, that antichrist, uh, antichrist singular, is coming, and many antichrists have come. And mm-hmm. uh, this this approach the New Testament gives, Jesus gives as well, is forewarned, is forearmed. If we are aware of what's coming, we'll be prepared for it. But the the real um, uh, joy of this text is the promise that John gives true believers that we have an anointing from the Holy One, and by that anointing we know the truth. And that anointing is the work of the Holy Spirit in every true Christian. By the Holy Spirit, we are able to identify the true gospel from false gospels. And even more than that, we're able to identify every biblical truth when we hear it. It doesn't mean Mm -hmm. we don't need teachers, but when good teachers teach us faithfully the Word of God, then genuine Christians... Uh, respond saying yes and amen to that, and they're excited about that, and they see that it's true, and that's because the Spirit is working in them. And this gives us security, it gives us hope and strength. So yes, the Antichrist, many of them, false teachers, uh, cult leaders, even political leaders that attack Christianity, they will come. But the genuine believers will stand fast by that anointing of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Andy, when John talks about Antichrist coming in the last hour. What do, mm-hmm. what does he mean by saying the last hour? Is that a, a, yeah, it's a, a logical it's, remark? Yeah, it's, it definitely is eschatological. You know, the last days have come. And, um, you know, I just preached this past Sunday on uh, the beginning of Peter's Pentecost sermon in Acts 2. And uh, he quotes Joel 2 about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit of God. And he says, it, and it will happen in the last days that I'll pour out my spirit. And we're in the last days, um, and, but it, we've been in the last days for 2,000 years now. It's since the, the advent, the coming of Christ, his, his life, his death, his resurrection, ascension to heaven. We're in the last days now, as the author of Hebrews says in Hebrews 1.3, in these last days God spoke to us by his son. So we have the phrase last days in a number of places, but only in First John do we have last hour. Um, but I don't yeah. think it's any different teaching. It's, it's just the same thing. We're in the final phase of God's plan for the human race of, of history. So we're in these, in these last days. And as it was in the last hour, uh, we know that, that uh, after the coming of Christ, the genuine 
Christ, the anointed one, false Christ, uh, have come uh, mimicking and imitating and trying to draw true disciples away after them. Yeah. Andy, I, one of the things I really don't like when it happens to me is when I get lied to. And mm. I, nobody likes that. Everybody hates getting mm. lied to. So how are yeah. we protected? How, is, how are we as children of God protected yeah. from the lies that are going to come from not only the Antichrist, but the, the, the mm-hmm. one big Antichrist? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and we should talk about that, the Antichrist versus Antichrist. But first, let me yes. answer the question the way you asked. We are protected from the lies by the working of the Holy Spirit in combination with the clear teaching of the Bible. The combination of the two um, is our defense. And so as we saturate our minds in biblical uh, truth, if we apply ourselves to the Word of God, and if we have the Holy Spirit inside us, we buttress our souls, we strengthen our souls, we reinforce our souls with truth from the Word of God. And that also is given by the Spirit of God under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. All of the biblical writers wrote. They were guarded from error. They wrote only uh, perfect truth. But then we ourselves are able to uh, identify that truth and to celebrate it and delight in it and believe in it. And that's how we became Christians, Bill. That's how you became a Christian. That's how I Mm. became a Christian. The Spirit took the finished work of Christ and applied it directly to us, similar to the painting of the blood on the doorposts and lintels by, um, you know, the Israelites under the, in the 10th plague, that, that blood is applied to us um, spiritually by the Spirit, and we believe in the gospel. We believe in Jesus Christ, and we've come to faith, and that is all by the work of the Spirit. And so you are a Christian, I am a Christian, because of the work of the Spirit, as much as because of the finished work of Christ on the cross. And that work of the Spirit has just begun in us, even if we've been Christians for many years. The Spirit has many more things to teach us, new things to teach us, but they're not new revelations. It's already in the 66 books of the Bible, but they're new things to us. We had not seen it before, and he continues to deepen and broaden good, sound theology and doctrine in us by the working like of the that. Spirit in the combination with, with Scripture. It's a combination of the written Word of God and the indwelling Spirit. Mm-hmm. Dr. Andy Davis is my guest. We're talking about how Christians persevere and how they persevere in the gospel. But Andy, let me mm-hmm. ask you about uh, the responsibility piece, because just as you mm-hmm. were describing that, it sounds that it's responsible because we want to have ourselves in sound doctrine for for. Mm-hmm the spiritual health of all of us. Yeah, we are responsible to put our minds and our hearts in the, in the presence of the Word of God. And we're responsible in, in, in a number of ways. There are what, what the Puritans would call means of grace or conduits of grace by which God pours you know, more and more grace into our hearts. And we have the initial grace of conversion, but then we need more grace. As James says, he gives us more grace. And the more grace comes by the ministry of the Word. And the way you do that is by being in the Word yourself every day, uh, the quiet time, taking in the Word. And, um, you know, I've given myself to memorization of Scripture. I believe in that. I think as you memorize Scripture, it goes deeper in your heart. But then going to a good Bible teaching and preaching church, you know, where you're going to hear good, sound expositions of the Word. I'm a sequential expositor. I can just go through books of the Bible. And we do the same thing in Bible studies. Um, we just walk through scriptures. And, and as you, you know, allow your soul, your mind, to be immersed in the Word of God, as Romans 12 says, we're transformed by the renewing of our minds. A number of years ago, I had an image of taking a rock from the, from the floor, forest floor and putting it in a river um, and swishing it around, and the river water would cleanse all of the dirt off of the rock, but it wasn't a river rock yet. It was still crystalline and jagged. But if you left the river, the rock in the river for a long time, then all the abrasion by the sand and all that would smooth it. And you know what it's like when you pull a, a, a river rock out, it's smooth as silk, and you just rub it on your mm-hmm. face, and it's just smooth. Mm-hmm. Well, that's a long time of the Word of God running through your mind and your soul, and you're being transformed by the renewing of your mind. So, yeah, we have a responsibility to do that. If you have a genuine Christian who doesn't give him or herself to the Word of God, they're going to be immature and buffeted and susceptible 
to false teaching. They're going to be susceptible to lies and deceptions. They'll be more vulnerable to the work of the plural antichrists that John mentions. Mm -hmm. Andy, I would like to talk a little bit about the the first and second comings of Christ. Now, where are the verses? How do we determine the verses in the New Testament that that gives us a sense of what the time is between those two? Yeah, um, well, definitely Matthew 23 is the most important chapter. Uh, what's sometimes called the Olivet Discourse, or the Little Apocalypse. Um, I'm sorry, Matthew 24, I said the wrong chapter. Matthew 23 is a sevenfold woe against the scribes and Pharisees, but Matthew 24, so I must have misspoke. But, you know, Jesus made a prediction that not one stone would be left on another. Everyone would be thrown down. The disciples were blown away by that. They never thought that would ever happen. So they came on the Mount of Olives and asked, when will these things happen, and what will be the sign of of your coming the end of the age? Matthew 24, verse 3, I think it is. And Jesus answered that question in a very beautiful and complex way in that long long chapter. It actually goes on into chapter 25 as well, with parables of readiness, like the five wise and five foolish virgins and and, you know, the thing. So that's really where you're going to see a lot about the first uh, and second coming of Christ. And uh, fundamentally, um, there's going to be signs, progressive signs, that will point to the end of the age. Uh, First, there are uncertain signs that just have to do with every generation, wars, rumors of wars, famines, earthquakes in various places. That's been 20 centuries of that. There's nothing unique about that. It happens every generation. Same thing with persecution. Mm -hmm. You'll be arrested and put to death and persecuted and brought before judges and tribunals to testify. And 2414 says, Matthew 2414 says, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. So what's happening between the first and second comings is the spread of the gospel from Jerusalem to Judea, Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. That's the, the progress you can mark. You can actually see it. If you know history, you know how, how explosive and widespread, especially over the last century or so, century and a half, has missions become. The name of Jesus is becoming more and more famous all over the world. And as that process happens, we're nearing the end. We're, we're getting to the end of God's purpose in the world. But then there are some signs that are directly tied to the final generation of final days before Christ comes. And those have to do with cataclysm, signs, wonders in the skies and the above, celestial things, with the sun, moon, and stars. Um, you know, a book of Revelation goes through all of this with the seven seals and the seven trumpets and the seven bowls. And the book of Revelation walks through all these things. These are terrible ecological disasters um, that will result in a a reshaping of, I think, every nation on earth. Um, I think if there's one third of the drinking water on earth is is fouled and undrinkable, uh, it's going to erase national boundaries and borders and people will be fleeing wherever they can go to get water. And I think from that, um, based on the Antichrist that's coming that John mentions, I believe that there'll be one world government that will kind of organize humanity in those dire last days, and uh, he will demand to be worshipped as God, and that's something we Christians will know that we uh, can never go in for. Um, We'll be aware of it ahead of time. False Christ and false prophets will appear, Jesus said, and perform great signs and wonders to deceive even the elect, if that were possible. But it's not possible because the Holy Spirit... Quick. Yeah, yeah, that's a, a a passage. I think that's Matthew twenty four. Uh, yeah, yeah. That is a passage that I've always wanted a little bit more information on. Yeah. Would you be willing after the break to talk about that a little bit more? Absolutely, I would love that. Terrific, terrific. Doctor Andy Davis is my guest. We're talking about how uh, true Christians persevere in the gospel, and we're going to uh, be back after a short break. You can learn more about Andy at twojourneys dot org. It's a great resource with tons of great teaching. We'll be right back. Hi, podcast listener. You know, I'm Bill Arnold, and my theme song says, What's for Dinner? And like when I'm grilling, I'm paying really close attention. And I know that ideal second to get the food off the grill. Like all good and ideal timings in life, right now would be an ideal time to be a cheerful giver to Faith Radio. Give now to support this podcast so that more people in more places might come to saving faith in Jesus and grow in their relationship and become a fully devoted follower. Click the link in the show notes or give now at MyFaithRadio.com.
My guest is Dr. Andy Davis, and you can learn more about him at twojourneys.org. He's the senior pastor of First Baptist Church in Durham, North Carolina. And we're talking today about how true Christians persevere in the gospel. And one of the passages that I've read in the past that I've always scratched my head a little bit over, because I don't like being lied to, is Matthew 24, 24, that says, For false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. Explain, Dr. Davis. Yeah, so this is a, a good harmonization with First John 2, which we started with about false Christs and false um, false prophets. Uh, you've heard that Antichrist, the main mm-hmm. final Antichrist is coming, but many Antichrists have come. And all through the Old Testament, there were false prophets. And there are going to be false teachers in the church age as well. And they come and they're, they're uh, Paul calls them in Second Corinthians, messengers of Satan. And they look good on the outside for even Satan masquerades as an angel of light. And so his servants look good. They look like... Um, uh, servants of righteousness, but they're not. And Jesus said, by their fruit, you will recognize them. You'll be able to see that they're wolves in sheep's clothing. You need to be able to discern, and you need to know what, what to look for. Um, and so that, that all of that, but you're going to take everything that every teacher says, and you're going to line it up with Scripture. And that's where, where we get back to First John 2. The anointing um, from the Holy One protects us from their false doctrine. We'll be able to discern the falseness of it. It usually is wrong about Jesus in some sense or wrong about salvation. Uh, usually it tends toward either legalism or license, one or the other, uh, one extreme or the other. Either you can do whatever you want in terms of sexual immorality or any of that, you're fine because God's forgiveness will cover you. That's license. Or it's extreme legalism where some of the cults are extremely harsh and there's harsh treatment of the body and discipline. All of that's false teaching. But we're able to discern and, and know that and the Holy Spirit protects us. Now, Jesus, speaking eschatologically, speaks about them doing even signs and wonders. And um, demons, uh, Satan and demons, can do supernatural works, things that would astonish us. Um, and the Lord will permit them to do that at the end, especially the Antichrist himself. Uh, Second Thessalonians says this very plainly, that the Antichrist will perform deceiving miracles to deceive um, the people who have not believed in Jesus. But the clear implication of Jesus' words are that the elect will not be able to be uh, deceived, and that's because, First John 2, because of the anointing we have from the Holy Spirit will be protected from it, we'll be able to discern it. But again, it goes back to the very thing we talked about earlier, and that is you have to immerse yourself in the Word of God and hear good preaching, um, study the Scriptures yourself, But even if you are a babe in Christ and immature and not even strong doctrinally, the Lord's going to protect us from, you know, that false teaching. We'll be able to see through it and not be swept away by it. Mm -hmm. Andy, I'd love for you to discuss apostasy, because John makes that interesting statement that they went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. I think that's kind of an image in my head of a lot of false teachers out there. That are saying yeah. all kinds and, of things, and, but and not, people too. not belonging. And people yeah, too. people, yeah. uh, just 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 uh, members. They're, we've all had that experience of someone that we thought was a strong Christian, and then yep. at some point they fall away. They they stop coming to church, and then you go see them. And it's like, no, nah, I don't believe any of those things anymore. And it's like, what happened to you? And you're shocked, and people are are distressed by it, and they begin to kind of look again at theology and wonder maybe you can lose your salvation, things like that. And, you know, therefore, there's a kind of more of a man-centered view where you have to hold on to Christ. It's up to you to, you know, basically keep saving yourself until the end. And that's not what the Bible teaches. And and actually, this passage is a clear indication of it. They were never of us. They never really belonged to us. They looked like Christians on the outside, but they were not true Christians. And the proof of that is they didn't continue with us. If they had been genuine Christians, they would have continued with us. John effectively, openly says that. So Jesus said it this way, he who stands firm to the end will be saved. But, um, you know, sound theology also says the opposite is true. He who is genuinely saved now will stand firm to the end. And not because we're so great, not at all. We're very weak. Uh, And not because our enemies are weak. No, they're very powerful. The world, the flesh, and the devil are incredibly powerful. 
but it's because God is determined to save us and will not let us be swept away. And so fundamentally, I believe in the eternal security of the believer, that if you have genuinely come to faith in Christ, if you have been justified <clears throat> through faith in Christ, you will most certainly be saved to the end. And the proof of this is in many places. Uh, but in John chapter 6, Jesus said, uh, I've come down from heaven not to do my own will, but this is, uh, but the will of him who sent me, and this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all that he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him will not perish, and I will raise him up at the last day, meaning resurrection. He's not going to lose any of us. I mean, think of it this way. We have a pretty sizable youth group, and imagine that, that they went out to uh, a retreat, a hundred of them, let's say kids, and uh, as they're coming back, the youth leader calls and says, I want you to know I brought 97 of the hundred kids safely back. How do you think the parents would feel about that? That's a pretty good track record, 97%. Would you think that would be an excellent uh, re uh, um, outcome of a hundred kids going on a trip? We have historical parents. <laughs> yeah, no, 100%. This is more important than that. This is more important yeah. than losing three kids on a, on a youth trip. This is right. eternal salvation. Jesus isn't, yeah. he was sent out by the Father to save these people. He will not lose any of them. I love it. But yeah. the, question, the question is, and there's many other verses, Romans 8, 29 and 30 says, those whom God foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of the Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers, and those he predestined, he also called, and those he called, he also justified, and everyone he justified, he glorified. Nobody's going to get lost. However, there is a dynamic, as we said earlier, about Bible intake. All genuine Christians have an energetic Christian life. They do energetic things by the Spirit in them that keep them healthy. They read the Bible. They confess their sins. They walk in holiness. They are part of good churches. No, they don't do these things perfectly. But this is the energetic, lively Christian life that he works in us. And when you see those marks of regeneration, you see that fruit happening in your life, you know that you're born again. And if so, you can have a good, strong assurance that nothing can separate you from the love of Christ. Mm -hmm. Andy, maybe just take off your teacher hat for a second and put on your pastoral counseling hat. When you yeah. uh, have parents say, gosh, you know, my... My son or daughter, when they were in high school youth group, they they, they made a profession of faith, but boy, they have yeah. completely walked away from their faith. There, do we do yeah. we call them prodigals? Do we call them uh, yeah. people who have just lost their way? You know, how do you encourage people who are in that situation? Because yeah. we get it often at the radio station here that yeah. you know, please, please, please pray for my son or daughter that's just walked away yeah. from the faith. Well, I think first of all, we need to, we can't give them false assurance. I'm not, I'm not going to say you hear this a lot, you know, uh, train up a child in the way, uh, you know, when, when he's, and when he's old, he'll not depart from it. It's just, first of all, it's a misunderstood verse. I just wouldn't go to that. I would say this. We don't have any guarantees about our loved ones. We really don't. Jesus actually said the opposite about our families. He said, I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. I came to turn a, a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be the members of his own household. He also said, and anyone who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. What is he saying? He's saying the biological family is not salvation, all right? Um, fundamentally, it's individual personal repentance and faith in Christ. Now, our job as parents is to supersaturate our kids with the gospel from infancy, like, like Timothy, from infancy. They know the scriptures, but that doesn't guarantee their own their salvation. Doesn't, I can't bring my kids with me to heaven. Mm -hmm. right? They have to believe on their own. So in that case that you, ga you gave, I would just say keep praying for your son, your daughter, uh, even with tears. When you have opportunities, seek to win them reach out mm -hmm. to them, but make certain that your first loyalty is to Jesus Christ. You know, above everything else, it is to him. And in the meantime, I, I obviously hate to say it, but it's just true. You're going to hurt. While they're living the life of the prodigal, they might be sexually immoral, they might be, or they're just not going to church. It's going to hurt. But I think that that's part of the world that we're in right now. Our sins hurt God as well. And he grieves, he wept over Jerusalem, there's a weeping involved, but we never give up hope. 
while they live, we never give up hope. God is able to convert anyone at any time. And so just keep that in mind and keep pleading to God that he will work in them. But we're not going to retool our theology. We're not going to retool our understanding of salvation. We're not going to lower the standards. That will not help the wayward son or daughter. We're going to pray for them and weep over them and persuade them and let God work in them. Mm-hmm. Dr. Andy Davis is my guest. Twojourneys.org is the place you can go find him and his teaching. There are sermons, there's devotionals, there's podcasts, there's classroom teaching and books. There's all kinds of things. I, I recommend checking it out. Twojourneys.org. So in Matthew 24, it talks about the increase of wickedness and the love of mm. most will grow cold. Mm. Mm. What does that mean, Andy? Uh, things are going to get worse at the end. I think they're just going to no, get I unhinged. Oh. Uh, and uh, it's getting worse. I mean, look, I look at our situation in America right now. We are in a decaying orbit of a generally positive relationship the true church has had with the surrounding culture. That's coming to an end, if it hasn't already come to an end. I think genuine biblical Christians are going to look weirder and weirder to the average American citizen. Uh, and it's not because we've changed or because we actually are weird. It's because there's more and more wor- worldview corruption that's going on. Satan is active. Satan is sowing his weird seeds in people's minds and hearts. And I think God's going to let it happen. He's going to let uh, more and more wickedness happen as it was in the days of Noah. It's going to. It says in Genesis 6 that the thoughts of people were only evil all the time. I think that's where we're heading, uh, except the uh, converted, the genuine believers will, will will stick out like a sore thumb, and we're going to be persecuted more and more viciously. So it's it's going to be hard, but in the end, uh, it's all just like Jesus said, the beginning of birth pains, and it's going to give birth to something incredibly beautiful, which is the new heaven, new earth, and our resurrection bodies in a world where there's no more death, mourning, crying, or pain. But before the very end, it will be the darkest it's ever been. So we're heading towards some very, very hard times. Even if you think about just the math in the numbers, I mean, in 1970, I think there were three and a half billion people. Um, Mm -hmm. Now there's almost eight billion. So there's an incredible Mm -hmm. amount of people on this earth over the last 50 years that now there's an increase of wickedness. Yeah. Uh, Well, most of those people are unconverted. I mean, you're you're adding, you know, probably five billion unconverted people to to the earth. And yeah. their their thoughts, their hearts are hardened. Their minds are idolatrous. Um, they break God's laws. Uh, they we're surrounded by that all the time. Now we need to look at it with humility, and say we're not any essentially any different. We were converted out of that by the grace of God, and we got to try to win as many of those people as we can. But the fact is, Jesus said, "Enter through the narrow." gate and broad is a road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it, but small the gate and narrow is a road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Many and only a few to my MIT brain is like 95 to 5, at best 90 to 10, I think, I, and I would not think 10%. I mean, that would be stunning to me if 10% of the world were Christian. I don't think it's true. Um, but, you know, we're surrounded by unbelievers, and we need to look on them with compassion and mourning, but also protect ourselves from the corruption that fills their own minds and hearts. Andy, I found it interesting that you said, as we uh, walk around the world today, we're going to look weirder and weirder as Christians because of the presence of so much evil in opposition to the the gospel. Yeah, yeah. Well, we are. I mean, you look at some of the um, ethical issues that are facing America, like abortion, uh, things like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, we we just see it very straight on. A human being is a human being and should be protectable from conception. But we're hearing things like reproductive justice, which is just stunning to me, this type of language, meaning the freedom to kill a baby. And the thing that was, makes no sense to me at all is the ethics of being able to ascribe personhood to another. You know, they are a person if I say they're a person. So a pregnant woman who yearns for and delights in her pregnancy and the baby, but if you were to attack her and cause a miscarriage, you'd be guilty of a crime. However, if she doesn't want the baby, she can do it herself through by means of the abortion industry and because she denies personhood. That literally makes no legal sense to me or ethical sense or philosophical sense. It's just absolutely bizarre. But we look bizarre by bringing that up. It's like we're weird people for upholding the sanctity of human life. And so fundamentally, we're going to look stranger and stranger. Same thing with sexual uh, purity, sexual ethics. We believe one man, one woman covenant marriage for life, um, absolute faithfulness to one another sexually for your whole life. That's what we believe. 
And mm-hmm. I would say if everyone followed that, there'd be a lot less grief in the world. You know, there'd be no fornication or adultery or any of that. But people don't. Uh, however, our views look weird. But they're not. They're not. It's just that they are, um, you know, they're off. So. Mm-hmm. All right, Andy, we'll take a little break. Dr. Andy Davis is my guest. You can learn uh, about him at twojourneys.org, twojourneys.org. There's lots of resources there. I highly uh, recommend you checking that out. We'll continue our discussion on true Christians and how they persevere in the gospel. We'll be right back. It's the Afternoon Show with Bill Arno. Let's get it started. Jump in your car. Yeah. What's for dinner? Yeah. It's the afternoon show with Bill Arno. My guest this afternoon is Dr. Andy Davis. He's the senior pastor at First Baptist Church in Durham, North Carolina, also the founder of twojourneys.org. It's a great resource and I highly recommend it. We're talking today about a, a believer's ability to, or, or a true Christian persevering in, in the gospel. And uh, Andy, when we talk about the anointing, I don't th- think we, I, I talk much about anointing on the show because I don't, I would love for you to discuss anointing and what anointing does to the heart of a, of a Christian, a true Christian's heart. Yeah, it's a great, great question. It's an image from the Old Testament when um, God wanted to identify a man for a specific role, generally uh, prophet, priest, or king, uh, he would be anointed with literal oil, and the oil would pour on his head. And so we see this with Saul, who became king of Israel, when uh, Samuel anointed him with oil, and he was called from then on the Lord's anointed. David called him that because he himself became the Lord's anointed. He was the son of Jesse, and Samuel uh, was sent to him to uh, anoint him to be the next uh, king after Saul was uh, defeated. Um, and so he was anointed with oil. And we see the same thing with Aaron, and we see it with um, prophets. Uh, Elisha was anointed to be Elijah's successor, etc. So the anointing, the oil, it marks the individual out for the role, but it also represents the outpouring of the Spirit on the person to enable them to do the role that they were called to do. So the day that uh, Saul was anointed as king over Israel, he became a changed man and started acting like a king, like a leader, when before he had not been, but the Holy Spirit came on him. Now, later the Spirit left him. Uh, Now, that's something that can never happen in the New Covenant. Jesus said that the counsel of the Spirit would be with you forever. He would never leave us or forsake us, but he forsook uh, Saul because he had had sinned. Uh, At any rate, the, the ultimate anointing was... Jesus uh, the Christ, the word Christ is the Greek form of Messiah or anointed one, and Jesus was anointed by the Holy Spirit of God to be the uh, the Messiah, the, the Savior of the world, the Son of David, and so the Holy Spirit descended on him as a dove, but the anointing is, uh, is the, his messianic identification, and it represents the outpouring of the Spirit. John uses this language for all Christians. We are all anointed, not with literal oil but with the Spirit of God, and we are thereby empowered for our role as sons and daughters of the living God. So that's the anointing. It just has to do with the coming of the Holy Spirit on every true Christian, and the privileges and the benefits of the Spirit are indescribable. Uh, The Spirit testifies with our spirit that we're children of God. The Spirit leads us or guides us into all truth. In 1 John 2, which we've mentioned several times in this uh, time together, he protects us from error and teaches us all things. He enables us to identify good teaching. You know, I have a gift of uh, teaching through the Holy Spirit that the Spirit gave that to me, but then he gives the corresponding gift in terms of my hearers to identify that what I'm teaching is true and right and biblical and helpful. And so the Spirit is active working, and that's the anointing. Uh, yeah, it is unusual language. We don't actually do the um, the anointing with oil like in the Old Testament, but it represents the activity of the Spirit. But it's got to be, Andy, one of the most amazing, powerful gifts that we get from God to be able to know the truth when we hear it. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And the greatest of all is concerning Jesus, that we believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. 
and that he died on the cross for our sins, and he rose again physically on the third day, and that he now sits at the right hand of God, and that someday he will come back, uh, that we believe all of those things is the direct activity of the Spirit of God on us. And it's just incredible. Also, the Spirit is said to be a deposit uh, guaranteeing our full inheritance, um, which is heaven. So the Spirit gives us foretaste of what that heavenly love and joy is going to be like. He gives us foretaste of God's love for us. He is able to, uh, Romans 5, 5 says that God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. That pouring language is similar to anointing language. And so he pours out his love into our hearts. But Bill, no matter how much we experience God's love or Christ's love now, it is nothing compared to what we're going to experience in heaven. We are, it's like we're, we're going to inherit billions of dollars and the Holy Spirit is like the, the the stipend check that we get if we're still like 16 or a minor and we can't come into our full inheritance. So we get a little bit of, of the amount, enough to live on, but the real inheritance is in the future. And that's the beautiful world of love to which we're going. We're going to just be immersed in the love of God and love of each other, too. Um, so the Holy Spirit gives us a foretaste of what that is. It's, as you said, an incredible gift uh, that the Lord has given to us. Mm-hmm. Andy, how how do the Antichrist deny Jesus as the Son of God? How do they do that? Yeah, so he he's going to say that very very plainly in chapter four of First John. He says um, that the Antichrist specifically denies that that Jesus is the Christ. It says in every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. So the doctrine of the incarnation is foundational. The spirit works faith in the doctrine of the incarnation that God, Almighty God, came to earth in the person of Jesus. And we believe that by the spirit. But the Antichrist denies that or opposes that. So you look at all the cults, whether it's um, Islam or um, Mormonism, uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses, they all do something about Jesus. They'll honor him as a prophet like the, like the Muslims do, or they will say that he is a created being like the Jehovah's Witnesses do. The Mormons have the strangest theology of all. Um, you know, they basically say what Jesus is, we may become what we are, he once was. So he has become a god. Um, it's just strange. They have very strange theology. Um, but that's what the cults do. That's what the spirit of Antichrist is. It's a denial that of the doctrine of the Trinity, and it's a denial of the incarnation of the second person of the Trinity, uh, Jesus, in human form, human flesh. So we believe all those things by the anointing or by the work of the spirit in us. Andy, but John makes it easy for us because he says, no one who denies the Son has the Father. So there mm-hmm. we go. Yeah, I mean, fundamentally, I would say the number one category of people who think they can have God without Jesus would be unbelieving Jews, so the ones that mm-hmm. Jesus dealt with in his, in his life. They denied that Jesus was the Son of God. They thought that was blasphemy, and so it is to this present day. Um, you cannot believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and think that he is on your side and deny his son. Um, it, it, you can't just have God and not have Jesus. That's just not possible. And so mm-hmm. fundamentally, if you, if you deny that Jesus is the Son of God, you don't have God. If you believe that Jesus truly is the Son of God, then you have God as well. So it's really Jesus is God's representative to the entire human race. And if you deny him, you don't have God. So he is everything. Um, Now, I'm not saying he's the same as the Father. They are separate persons of the Trinity. I want to use the word separate. But but we have God the Father by faith in God the Son. Mm -hmm. And I love that John says that. Whoever acknowledges the Son has the Father also. Absolutely. I mean, it's hard. Bill, I'll put it this way. We really cannot measure the loyalty, if we can use that word, the, the fierce loyalty the Father has for His Son. When Jesus died on the cross under the wrath of God, um, He fundamentally, uh, you know, and then was raised from the dead, He said in Psalm 110, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. He also says in Psalm 2, fundamentally, if you try to fight against the Lord's anointed, you try to fight against the Christ, 
um, his wrath will, God's wrath will be on you. He says, kiss the son, lest he be angry with you and you be destroyed in your way. Psalm 2. So fundamentally, God is passionately committed to the glory of his son, just as his son was passionately committed to the glory of the father. So there's no way you can divide the Trinity. You have to have the father, son, and the spirit together. Mm-hmm. Andy, I'm still a little curious about anointing. I know that's a topic we yeah. could probably spend a whole hour on, but uh, yeah. there is going to be uh, real anointing and, and, and counterfeit anointing. And how do we, what is the difference? Um, say it again, real anointing. I, I just want to... And counterfeit anointing. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah, so I think what that what that would mean is just, um, you know, the Antichrist, the word anti in the Greek doesn't mean against, it means instead of or in the place of, like a substitute Christ. And so okay. basically Satan is going to try to counterfeit Jesus and counterfeit the miracles and counterfeit um, the gospel. This is what he does. He's a counterfeiter. And so uh, the, the false anointing would be, you know, uh, uh, just kind of faking the effects of the spirit, faking the miracles, faking the so-called religiosity. Um, Paul says, as I mentioned, the super apostles, the false teachers in Corinth said, look good. They look righteous. They look nice, but they're like the whitewashed tombs. They look good on the outside. It's counterfeit. The whole thing's counterfeit. The genuine true anointing starts with the person of Jesus Christ, believing that he is God in the flesh and that he died and rose again. And then that the word of God is perfect. The, the, inerrant word of God, and you can recognize the truth. That's the true anointing. And then it produces the true Christian life, the fruit of the Spirit, holiness, the marks of regeneration that the New Testament so plainly describes, humility, um, the description of, of, the, of love in First Corinthians 13, love is patient, love is kind, doesn't envy, doesn't boast, not easily angered, or the Beatitudes, somebody who's a spiritual beggar, who's meek and who's merciful and who hungers and thirsts for righteousness. That's the genuine Christian life. And when you see that in someone, that's the true anointing of the Spirit. Mm -hmm. We'll take a little break and be right back with Dr. Andy Davis. Learn more about him at twojourneys.org. We'll be right back. Welcome is a word said universally all over the world. Every language on the planet has their own way of making a friendly greeting. At Faith Radio, when we welcome, we really mean it. Learn more about us by requesting a free Welcome Pack gift. Text the word WELCOME to 877-933-2484 or visit MyFaithRadio.com to request your Welcome Pack today. And a warm welcome to you. I'm back with Dr. Andy Davis. We're chatting today about the the uh, how true Christians persevere in the gospel. I got so many thoughts in my head right now, Andy. I can't even sort them out. Uh, but in First John uh, chapter two and verse twenty four, it says, um, "As for you, see that what you have heard from the beginning remains in you." Mm. What is this command, Andy, and how do we obey it? I think it's the gospel. I think it's the delight we have in Christ when we were first converted. I mean that joy. Uh, what what the uh, what Jesus said to the church at Ephesus when he said, you have forsaken your first love, don't let that happen. See that what you received and heard from the beginning, which is the gospel, the simple, pure gospel, remains in you, you delight in it, you believe in it, it brings you every bit as much joy, if not even more, as the day you were first uh, converted. See to it. So what that means is guard your heart, don't get drawn away into worldliness and sin and wickedness, but make certain that you continue to love and esteem Jesus for what he did. Um, see to it by immersing yourself in the Word of God, in the Bible, in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Um, just see uh, the greatness of the person of Christ. See to it that what you heard from the beginning continues in you and you delight in it. This is how we know that we're Christians. It's because the gospel continues to bring us joy and delight. And so here's the thing. When, when I, every week, I preach the gospel very plainly and clearly. I do other things. I preach through the whole text and explain it. But I also call on sinners to believe. And I go back over the simple truths of the gospel. And I've recently exhorted some of our church. I said, when I do that, please pray for anybody in the congregation who is not a Christian, that they would cross over from death to life. But don't just do that. 
pray for yourself that you'll continue to have the same delight in that simple gospel message that you had when you first heard it. Oh, I love that. That's fantastic. All right, I need some teaching and context on on the verse in 1 John uh, 2, in verse 28, it says, And now, dear children, continue in him, so that when he appears, we may be confident and unashamed before him at his coming. Yeah. Well, I think what this means is you need to live a holy life. And if you look at First John, he's saying, look, if you claim to be a Christian, you're walking in darkness, you're a liar. But if you walk in the light as he is in the light, and then you have fellowship with each other and with God. It's a holy life. Now, we're all going to sin, and we're going to confess our sins. But the fact of the matter is, sin is a shameful thing. And we don't know what we'll be doing when the Lord returns. He says he will come in an hour when you do not expect him. He's not giving us any more warnings. He'll give us the general warnings, eschatological warnings I've already talked about. But he'll come when he comes, and you'll be doing whatever you're doing at that moment. And so make certain that the moment, whatever, whatever, uh, you're doing in life, you will not be ashamed to be doing it if it were the last moment on earth. Mm-hmm. And so I think that's what it is. It's a, it's an appeal for holiness. It's an appeal to make certain that whatever you're doing, you will not be ashamed. Now, I do believe that Judgment Day will be an incredible mixed experience for Christians. It will be unmixed for non-Christians, nothing but terror. But for Christians, it's mixed because we lived mixed lives. And the truth of this is in Second Corinthians 5, where it says, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one, each one may receive what is due him for the things done in the body, whether good or bad. Well, Bill, there's mm-hmm. a, mixed, a mixed report. And didn't mm-hmm. we live mixed lives? My feeling is let's have as little sin as possible in our lives. I know we're going to sin. We're going to confess our sins. But let's make certain that we are doing the right things and walking by the power of the Spirit so that when he comes, we won't be ashamed. I also want to yeah. minimize how many uh, bad things that I said or thought or did on Judgment Day, because I am going to have to give an account. Now, I'm not going to go to hell. I won't be condemned for those things, but I do have to give an account. And so uh, I think what he's saying there at the end of chapter 2 is make certain that you're living the good, healthy Christian life so that when he comes, you won't be ashamed at the moment of his appearing. Mm-hmm. Really good, Andy. Thank you very much for this teaching and this time. Um, there is something in verse 29. We've only got about a minute and a half left, but yeah. it says, if you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who who does what is right has been born of him. Yeah. And that's a, a, a great a great verse to, to close with yeah. as we think about Absolutely. living a true Christian life. Yeah, for sure. I mean, righteous means according to the standard the standard of God's Word, and that's what the Holy Spirit comes and works in us. If we are living according to that righteous standard, we um, are true Christians. That's what he's saying. Now, we're not going to do it perfectly, but that's what Jesus said in Matthew 6.33. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. That's what we're seeking. We want to live a righteous, upright life for his glory. Mm -hmm. Well, certainly praying for your part of the world and the people that you know in Mm -hmm. North Carolina that's been devastated by the storm. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Pray that we'll just have opportunities in the midst of all this suffering to shine the light of the gospel in a way that will be transformative for people. Yeah. Amen. Thank you, Andy, and have a wonderful rest of your evening. I appreciate you being Thank you for being inviting with, me. It's always a today. joy to talk to you, Bill. I love okay, it. Thank you so much. Dr. Andy Davis has been my guest. Um, he's a senior pastor at First Baptist Church in Durham, North Carolina, but His website, twojourneys.org, is quite impressive. It's got so much material, uh, sermon series, devotionals, podcasts, classroom teaching, books. Everything is right there, and you can check it out. If you've missed any of the teaching today, we uh, discussed how uh, believers, true Christians, persevere in the gospel, and that there are lots and lots of antichrists that are trying to distort the truth. And the good news is that as believers, uh, we know the difference between truth and falsehood, especially when it comes to the Son of God. And so thank you very much for spending time with me today. Um, If you missed any of today's show, in hour one, I talked to Dr. David T. Lamb. We talked about King David, and this has been wonderful teaching from Andy Davis today. 
But that's all the show I have for you. So I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope uh, you've have a I'll be, hope you have a wonderful night. Let us know how we can uh, pray for you and care about you and journey with you. You can always send prayer requests over to eight seven seven nine three three two four eight four. Have a wonderful evening, and I'll see you tomorrow. Thanks for listening. Programming like this is made available through your support. Information available at MyFaithRadio.com.